bladder cancer affects a lot of individuals across the globe. Um, it really is the fourth or fifth most common cancer, um, depending on how you rank cancers. And it's a very, very common cancer that we as urologists and urologic oncologists treat globally. And as recognized by Prime, you know, the International Bladder Cancer Group is a group of experts that have come together in, in trying to improve treatments and of course, quality of life for our patients. And when it comes to BCG, there's sort of a special role that BCG plays in the management of bladder cancer, but also in the hearts of us um, globally, because it's such a universally accepted and available treatment option. And uh, for that reason, you know, when you asked us to talk about this in, in for today's webinar, it was almost like the perfect uh, topic to talk about. So in the next few minutes, um, I'm going to briefly introduce the concept of BCG for non-Muslim of bladder cancer. And it's ironic that I'm saying briefly introduce in the year 2021, because BCG has been around, as you know, uh, for decades, right? But even today, there are certain myths and mysteries uh, behind BCG. And this is a topic that I was actually invited um, several years ago at an inter give at an international stage. And I've compressed from that talk, and I'm going to present here today in, in a shorter amount of time. Um, just in the interest of the program per se, because after my talk, we're going to launch into a case panel discussion, which I think will be an ideal format uh, to disseminate knowledge in which uh, two of my friends and colleagues from around the globe will be presenting cases. Um, I'll pretend to be the expert that knows something about bladder cancer and try to respond, and then we'll also have a, a nice discussion amongst ourselves. So why is this topic important today? You know, when we think of cancer immunotherapy, you go to any meeting, the GEOASCO meeting that was just finished uh, a couple of weeks ago or, or any other meeting, and you'll see essentially that people think about immuno-oncology in the sense of checkpoint inhibitors, PDL1 inhibitors, um, and it's not just in meeting proceedings, it's even in the lay media, all over the newspapers, everywhere, um, you look at checkpoint inhibitors and that's the immune oncology that everybody talks about. But people tend to forget that the original cancer immunotherapy, the immunotherapy that's been used for cancer for almost forever, um, is BCG. And urologists are very, very attuned to using immune therapy for cancer. And in fact, in times when there's no global shortage of BCG, as urologists, we administer about 1.2 million doses of BCG annually. So that's a lot of immunotherapy that's being administered to our patient, and it is an extremely effective immunotherapy. But there are some myths about BCG, and I'm going to try to dispel them in the short talk. So the first myth, and this is ironic that we hear this even today, even in the year 2021, is you'll sometimes hear people stand up and say, well, BCG doesn't really reduce progression rates. I'm only reducing recurrence rates. So it's just a temporary fix for the patient. And that's just not true. This is an older publication. I'm presenting this because it's important that everybody recognizes classic papers. And this paper from 2002 is the classic paper from Sylvester that showed beyond a doubt, looking at multiple trials and the analysis of progression that BCG does reduce progression rates when it's used appropriately. And by appropriate treatment, what I mean is that BCG will reduce progression rates only when maintenance therapy is used. So if you're putting your patient on BCG therapy and you're not using maintenance therapy, then sure, you are not helping your patient. You're not reducing progression rates. But if you use BCG appropriately, then you are reducing progression and you're actually decreasing the need for our patients to undergo radical cystectomy, which is a life altering you know, procedure, even though as, as a group, we've had multiple advances, especially through the Vatikiti Foundation on improving quality of life after radical cystectomy, clearly patients don't want that treatment. And this is just fresh off the press. Uh, this was just published last month in the Journal of Urology. It's online right now. This is data from MD Anderson Cancer Center showing that if you use BCG appropriately, the incidence of progression in the intermediate risk patients, which are the low grade patients, is zero. It's essentially zero. None of these patients progress. And even in the CIS TAT1 combination group at five years, the progression rate is less than 10%. And this is important for any of the trainees that might be on the call, because if you look at classic publications uh, from the Journal of Urology, the AUA, et cetera, they cited progression rates of 30% and cystectomy rates of an additional 30%. So classic historic series suggests that 60% of patients will not respond to BCG and need some other treatment, but that clearly isn't true if it's used appropriately. The second myth is that progression is affected but we don't know what maintenance therapy to use. And again, that is not true. 
this is the only maintenance regimen which has been proven to be effective. This is the classic SWOG protocol or the LAM protocol after Don Lam, um, who proposed this and showed where if you use the SWOG protocol, which is six weeks induction BCG followed by three weekly maintenance at three months, six months, and every six months for um, three years, then you have a decrease in recurrence rates both in CIS and in papillary only patients. Now, if you use maintenance in other fashions, such as one installation every three months or one installation every month, it does not help. So in these cases, yes, maintenance is no better than induction alone, but you should not be using that maintenance schedule. And the most common mistake that urologists used to make was giving six weeks of BCG, then waiting about three to six months and giving six more weeks of BCG. And Jean Palau, who's you know, a founding member of the IBCG as well, showed in a very good multi-center Spanish studies that doing that doesn't really help improve the results of induction BCG alone. And there's reason for that. This is, again, a classic paper that shows the induction of cytokines. It's been replicated many times, including at our center and others. But I want to show this because this is a classic paper that shows that when you're giving BCG to a BCG-naive patient, you have an increase in the cytokines all the way up to week five and six. But when you then reinduce a patient that has been exposed to BCG, you only get the rise in cytokines up to week three. And after that, you're actually suppressing the immune system. So more BCG isn't better. You have to do it in the six plus three fashion to get the optimal response. And more recently, just last this year, um, this was published. This is the Nimbus phase three study that tried to see if you can alter this maintenance regimen using the six plus three, but decreasing the amount of BCG. And this is again, a very classic study. You see the distribution of patients that, that had the BCG therapy. This is the bottom line. When you try to mess around with this classic six plus three regimen, again, they follow it six plus three, but they just decrease the number of installations of BCG. The recurrence rate went from, you know, eight, 10% with the classic arm to 18, 25%. And so clearly six plus three is the way to do it. And that is something that should no longer be a misconception with BCG. Now, another myth is really that BCG is only indicated for high-risk disease. This is not true. A classic uh, study, URTC um, 311 showed that BCG is effective even for low-grade tumors. And in fact, in the low-grade tumors, BCG is effective enough that it actually decreases um, the incidence of metastatic disease, which is low to begin with, but it still has a powerful enough reduction in the incidence of death, metastatic disease, and overall in disease-specific survival. Now, clearly in the times of BCG shortage, our group and others have come out with ways in which you can save BCG for patients who truly need it. So for the intermediate low-risk patients, uh, sorry, intermediate low-grade patients, we recommend that you follow this um, risk stratification. And only patients who have multiple tumors large tumors, early recurrences, and frequent recurrences, so essentially three or more point factors should be considered to have severe enough disease to get BCG. Otherwise, you really should be saving the BCG for the patients with high-risk disease who are really needed. Now, another common thing that we hear being talked about is that BCG is something that patients cannot tolerate. This is, again, based on old data, old series, and, and misinformed people. If you look at more contemporary studies, such as URTC 30962, in a comparison of full dose and one third dose BCG in close to 1,300 patients, less than 10% of patients had to stop BCG for toxicity. And when the IBCG performed an international study led by Fred Vitches, um, looking at close to 970 patients, we found that only 5.2% of patients had to stop BCG for toxicity. So clearly, when BCG is done appropriately, and we use certain tricks, such as making sure we don't give BCG when there's visible hematuria, making sure the catheter goes in atraumatically, allowing patients to continue on aspirin therapy and using antispasmodics, et cetera, et cetera. These patients do have the ability to tolerate a full three-year course of BCG therapy. Now, one other thing that you know people now talk about is, okay, fine, BCG is all well and good, but once BCG fails, which it does, uh, there's a standard definition of BCG uh, failure, and, and we know exactly what to do. And that's not really true. So I want to touch uh, upon this for or in the remaining few minutes. And essentially, there is a lot of confusion as to what constitutes failure of BCG. And when you look at the different categories, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, so don't try to read this slide, but essentially there's refractory BCG, where the patient has never uh, responded to BCG. There's relapsing failure, where patients have 
um, responded, but then recurred. There's intolerant. And then there is the definition, which we all need to remember today, which has been adopted by regulatory bodies across the globe, which is the BCG unresponsive definition. And follow me through this exercise because it will emphasize why timing is very important. And you can do this exercise on any publication that's available in the public domain. I'm just using Don Lamb's publication from the year 2000, in which there were 278 patients with carcinoma in site two that were randomized to induction BCG and induction plus maintenance BCG. After six weeks of BCG, as you would expect, the CR rates were about 55 to 58%, which is what we see even today. About half the patients will respond to an induction course of BCG. Now look what happens in the arm when you just monitor these patients for another three months without more BCG. The CR rate goes from 58% all the way up to 67%. So just with time, more patients respond than at the three month interval if you just wait and give these patients more time. But if you actually give these patients another three weeks of BCG, the CR goes from 55% all the way up to 84%. Now, a lot of studies came in at this point, only after six weeks of BCG, and gave the patient a drug X, whatever that drug is, and said, oh, well, great, we got about a 50% response in these patients, this drug should be approved. But that's not true, because with just three more weeks of BCG, you can salvage about 64% of these patients. So clearly, BCG has to be given appropriately, and only after an appropriate course of BCG therapy should a patient be deemed to have failed BCG therapy. And that's why our group, the IBCG, came together in, in 2014, and this is a publication a couple of years later. And then the GUASCO group um, came together as well, and we proposed this definition of BCG unresponsive disease, which has been now been adopted by the FDA in their standard guidance to industry, investigators, and in, in regulatory bodies when it comes to approval of drugs in this space. And essentially, for us to consider something having failed BCG and being BCG unresponsive, they should have persistent or new T1 high-grade disease at the first evaluation, because that is clearly deadly disease. If they have CIS, they should be within 12 months of an adequate course of BCG. And if they have recurrent TA or T1 disease, so they responded but have recurrence, this should be within six months of adequate BCG. And adequate BCG should be six weeks of BCG plus at least one maintenance course, for practical reasons, if the patient misses one dose of induction and one dose of maintenance, that's allowed by the FDA. So really, this is definition is something that has only been recognized since 2017, 2018, after the FDA adopted our recommendations. But since then, there's been an explosion of studies, an explosion of studies in this space. I'm not going to go into too much detail into what these drugs are, because this will come up during our case presentations. But so many different trials have undergone. Uh, Pemerlozumab was approved earlier, or and now it's 21, so in 2020 for this group of patients. Um, the gene therapy with Adstilodrin, uh, which was initially developed at MD Anderson, but now is being uh, worked on by Fergene, is also potentially going to be approved and looked at the FDA. So a lot of different drugs combinations will essentially be available for our patients. A couple uh, slides on the uh, BADAS uh, study, uh, because I was asked to put this in here, you know, BCG as a defense against SARS-CoV-2. Um, just a brief background here, you know, obviously when COVID hit all of us last year, we're trying to look at different correlations and different associations to see why certain countries had more incidents and why more people were dying in, in North America, for example, as opposed to India, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point, I reached out to Dr. Hegarty, who, who I've known for many years now, um, and he was able to kind of do a deep dive into the association of BCG vaccination programs in different parts of the world and the incidence of BCG. And there's also a scientific rationale for this because in, in elegant studies that have been performed, it has been shown that when BCG is given to elderly in, uh, individuals, their response to vaccination, such as yellow fever, influenza, et cetera, is augmented just by the nonspecific response to BCG. So when we looked at this, this is a publication, the, one of the earliest publications, and I put this time and date up because it was then exploded all over you know, media, et cetera. We found that in countries that have had prior exposure to BCG, and BCG exposure was really, in some ways, a surrogate for the immune robustness of that population. There was a lower incidence, and even if the incidence then catches up, there's a lower death rate in that population. And then that, of course, exploded all over media. You can see Dr. Hegarty here in an interview that, that we uh, conducted. Um, and again, it was all over the place. 
But our study, the BADS study is BCGS defense against SARS-CoV-2 has um, essentially been performed in Australia with 10,000 subjects. It's, it's also in, in uh, Europe uh, where it actually originated by Mihai Neria's work. Uh, the Gates Foundation is supporting this. And of course, in the United States, um, we are uh, still looking at the data, especially in patients who are now, or individuals who are now actually getting the specific SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 vaccines to see how their immune system might have been augmented by them being exposed to BCG. So with that, I, I wanna thank you again for your attention.